Hi, welcome everyone. Um, as Sarah said, we are here in the Curatorial Research Bureau, which uh, for those of you who don't know, is part of the California College of the Arts. I am here with Kat and Eli, who both have worked here as preparators, and we've had the great pleasure of working with them and seeing their amazing work and making stuff happen. And tonight they're gonna talk with each other. Kat is the manager of events, exhibitions, and partnerships yeah. at San Francisco Art Institute, and Eli is the exhibitions and collections manager at Mills College. And I'm gonna hand it over to you guys. So, <coughs> Eli, when I've looked at your work, both paintings and drawings, and maybe even sculptures, I've noticed a lot of like reoccurring images that are both animal or bodily. What does that, what is the conceptual purpose of using these reoccurring images? Cool, good question. <laughs> um, I think that, I don't know, um, in the recent past I was drawing a lot of bodies that were extremely muscular, androgynous. Um, super, I was really interested in the way in which um, masculinity might have been um, manifested physically as the, in the form of muscles and then how how that inherently for us seems masculine and how problematic that could be for um, um, multiple gendered folks or femme identified people with muscles and so I was really interested in um, gender but like in, an, in a um, general way and not necessarily in a personal way for the for the bodybuilders that I was making um, but for the for, for currently right now the the bodies that I'm making are actually floating heads which are um, blue faced I, I call them my trans ancestors and they're kind of like they live in this world of my paintings that are they're like guides or seers and caretakers um, but I also see them simultaneously as self-portraits of seeing myself in the past, present, and future in this blue-faced, wild character. Um, I think it's, yeah, it's kind of interesting to think about. I'm gonna take a deep breath. Um, my ancestors and then trans ancestors and what kind of, the lack of language that there was to even describe the ways in which they felt um, as far as gender and sexuality goes. So I've just kind of been processing that with my own identity and uh, thinking about my um, childhood. So those are the, the bodies that I'm, I'm making. And um, I, the animals are totally separate, but part, part right? They're, they're, also, they're also caretakers and they're also um, guides. And I see them both of, as all representing emotions, ways in which that I, um, I think that I had felt when I was a child not having had a boyhood, um, ways in which that I um, hope that I can become. Um, for example, uh, horses are incredibly masculine and also feminine. They're beautiful, but they're very self-assured and they're confident and they have power. Um, and that, 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 that quality is, resonates with me as far as being a man, but also in this like childlike wonder way. Um, and I have many other animals that I like to paint and think about in this non-narrative narrative painting. Um, but I think that's a good way to answer your question. Yeah, that's and great. <coughs> that didn't sound like any of the times that I practiced myself before. <laughs> that's probably better. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'll ask you next. Great. Uh, <clears throat> so I was really struck when we were talking about your work previously about how how you described the ways in which the viewer might perceive your practice, which is very um, performance-based, um, momentary, and um, experimental, or ex excuse me, um, experience-based. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm interested in how you were describing that that's different, different from the ways in which a viewer will experience just an art object or a painting on the wall, and I'm interested in, and I'd like everyone to hear how you um, defer your work from that kind of work. Yeah. So I've made a lot of sculptural objects, but I always like to think of my sculptural objects in terms of uh, objects that are able to move and perform on their own. I never really got 
those physical forms to do the things that I wanted to do, but I was able to, through like installation performance work, find an intermediary where the object and myself as a moving body were able to both perform and then stand in as images and then movements. And I enjoy the space in which performance or installation work asks a viewer to watch me and then imagine themselves as me and through this like strange version of empathizing or even just like relating to myself and the work actually goes through an experience that may or may not have been what they intended to enter into when watching the work. And so that's why I also like to build my performance pieces to be, they're, they're oftentimes dealing with a lot of like um, dark context in relationship to oppression around money or capitalism or familial or social structures. But I like to add a number of very comedic edges to take some of the harshness off and allow someone to experience what might be a difficult topic through a little bit of uh comedy or even like physical comedy like falling <laughs> yes because i am also a huge advocate for um visible failure <laughs> <laughs> i think it's important <laughs> you can be successful in your failures uh on that note are you handling <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, I'll, I'll ask you. Okay. Okay, so um, how did you get, can you talk about how you got started in um, art handling in general, and then I guess where you are now? Yes, um, so I got started art handling when I was in grad school. I had never known that there were people who put art on the walls, so somehow that had eluded my mind. And when I found out that was something you could do, I was both in love with the fact that you could touch all of the art, um, but that you also get to see all the art, and you get to be behind the scenes, and you get to build the things. It was kind of a little bit of everything that I loved about institutions. Uh, and through grad school and working in the galleries there, I found that it was going to be a more viable way for me to make a living. Um, because I actually went into school with the intention of teaching, but it was too, paid too little, so that went out the window really quick. And I went into art handling instead, and it also gave me access to like a number of skills and people and resources that became other versions of education for me. Like working at SFMOMA, I learned about painting just from looking at the work. So there was this thing that kept me going in art handling. Um, but then eventually started to wear on me was the way in which art handling because of its like dominating masculinity and its history in terms of only hiring essentially what is a long line of like white art bros uh, became very tiring for me to be inside of those spaces because I was constantly trying to verbally, non-verbally or through action defend the fact that I had knowledge or skills. So it has slowly moved into the realm where I'm trying to, or more interested in teaching art handling as a skill to kind of also simultaneously shift the culture of art handling because it's a really cool and interesting line of work. And I've done a little bit of everything at this point, whether it's like mopping or painting 8 million walls or ha hanging like a 1,200 pound metal piece forklifts the whole nine years. Yeah, that's a huge spectrum. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm also curious how you got started in art handling and maybe you're just, you're like on the other side of the bay okay. and then over here too. Yeah, I've been over here for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, I Kind of similar, I started art handling well, after, for when I was in grad school my second year I met um, a few folks that are now my great friends at in the Mills Museum who are, were art handlers at the time. Um, and I just started bonding with them and learned about art handling too was like this mystery thing that the art the artist must put up their work that's what I, I thought I, had, I, had, I was pretty naive to that idea um, but I had plans to go um, do construction and then get my contractor's license and do um, 
more building, uh, and I did that for a bit and realized that it wasn't the right fit and it wasn't um, the right kind of making that I was interested in to have a parallel practice with it. Um, so I went back to Mills and started doing prep work and um, really enjoyed the way in which my my body and mind work in concert and that that, that to me feels like um, where my brain operates at the highest Eli way is when my body is also um, working with my mind. Um, and I also just felt like I was doing sculpture all day even though I was chipping drywall or whatever on my knees, taking paint off the floor. There was something that still felt um, creative about it. Um, so that's where I started was at Mills and then I um, eventually branched out over here to these beautiful folks here, um, Berkeley and um, other galleries and uh, yeah, so I've been doing it ever since and it just feels like a really good um, place to be at the moment and yeah, now I'm at Mills and I have a team there and um, yeah, well, it's, it feels good. You have a, cr a crew or a team? Um, I'm going to say team. Um, I usually say crew, but right now a team feels good. <laughs> um, so I think that something that's interesting in relationship to both being like an artist and an art handler and these kind of realms that we find ourselves in always existing one foot in one world and one foot in the other uh, is to think about how like our personal identities have played into both our art making but also into our experiences being preparators. Both maybe as people on teams but leading teams now too. Right. And those dynamics. Mm -hmm. So do you have some experiences you'd like to share yeah. in that realm? I think my <laughs> previously thought out answer can um, work with it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I guess for me, um, the way in which my identity affects my relationship to my art is it's like it very immediately, my identity is what I make my art about. It's, um, it's the reason why I make art. So the, it's very cyclical in the sense that I'm processing my identity and the stuff that I'm dealing with day to day, which feels very, my art making feels kind of therapy adjacent. It's kind of like part of a, the whole of self care in a way. Um, and, and so, but then I also make my work about my identity and processing this, I guess, imaginary childhood um, intertwined with my real childhood. Um, so yeah, my identity is very core to that. As far as my relationship to my identity and art handling, it's been evolving um, definitely for throughout the last, for actually the entire time I've started doing prep work. But, um, I think most pronounced is the way in which um, my, my physicality has evolved throughout the years and the way in which I'm interacted with is subtly different. And um, sometimes, and I don't, um, yeah, I think that, this, that this, part of the conver this part of my answer could be like an entire um, evening of conversation, but I think the way in which um, I'm really careful, I guess, is the, what I want to say, and really self-reflexive the way in which I'm interacting with people, um, because I'm perceived and I'm seen and I am a white man, so I think that I'm, I'm um, definitely trying to be incredibly careful of the space that I'm taking, what I'm saying, who I'm saying it to, how I'm saying it, mm -hmm. I think it's the most important part. Um, and now that I'm in a lead position um, where I'm telling folks what to do for the day, there, that there's a sense of um, self-consciousness that I think is really important to this kind of a work, which I've seen in a lot of institutions of, of folks that have done it really well, where you just learning how to communicate in a the great way, but I think my identity for sure has um, lent itself to helping me be better at doing that. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess for me, my work has always been tied to my identity because it's always a version of like self um, portraiture and self portraiture in the way in which it is expanded to represent and work with the forces and pressures that are constantly being put upon the female identity, whether it's literally in like a homemaker situation or if it's someone who's working. And I like to play a lot with 
what is considered to be either masculine or feminine, especially because throughout my life, despite any way that I have appeared, I have a tendency to be considered masculine for a woman, whatever that means. And like that can be taken as in like my tone or uh, my assertiveness um, or even maybe just like the fact that I feel self-assured is enough to do that. Um, and so I definitely like to explore what it means to be able to take those risks regardless in my work and see what happens mm. uh, without any apology. And I think that's kind of the same approach I've had to being an art handler, which is that I am uninterested in apologizing for either knowing or not knowing in any specific situation. And not knowing and being able to ask for information and not being ashamed to ask rather than to fuck up a Picasso, you know? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> Yeah. And I think that that's where these balances come into play, where communication is something that's regarded as important and where everyone is allowed to come to the table with a certain way of knowing and asking and behaving. And instead of there being like a competition of like who's the better art handler by pretending that you can lift crates without hurting your back, but it's like at a certain point you're 50 or 60 years old, that shit doesn't fly anymore. Mm -hmm. So I think that my relationship to identity has been always to push the fact that I'm a woman, which I have been laying off of a little bit more as I've been able to like expand not only what it means to be a woman, like to expand that word, but also to expand who should be involved in the conversation and really it's like a little bit of everybody. Yeah. And I think that, uh, that now that we're in this moment where people are collecting and having these conversations and participating, that it's a lot more fluid in a way that's like very freeing because mm -hmm. it's more about just how do we communicate and less of having to like point at people and base their skill levels and understandings on mm -hmm. what they appear to be. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for hosting us. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you.